Stone's biography of Jack London, and many more. There were travel books from all corners of the earth. It was like the world. We all looked upon that bookcase as a piece of furniture only, and what we especially liked were the carvings. But one day, as a young boy, I picked out one of those books and opened it, and I discovered that it made sense to me. It was possible to read, so I did. My mother was an intellectual. She worked for a long time in a chocolate factory. Then she washed schools, public buildings, hotels. She washed at the Park Hotel where the rock groups stayed when they played in Oslo. One time she came into a suite where the bathroom was a real mess. And there were two of the boys still in the room and she bowled them out. They kind of cracked and said, it will never happen again, Mom. And I believe they were Robert Plant and Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. <laughs> nice ordinary lads, she said afterwards, just a drink too many, happens to everybody. My mother always read books. Books in Norwegian, Danish, Swedish, German and English. She read Hemingway and Steinbeck. She read Alan Silito and Aldous Huxley. She read Somerset Maugham. She read Knut Hansen. She read Dubliners by James Joyce, in fact. I never saw her sleep. When in bed, she did not touch the pillow with her head, but rested her elbow on it, her hand supporting her head. And I could ask, what are you reading? And then she did like this. Ginter Gras, she said, die Blechtrummel. My mother thought I was intellectually lazy because I didn't know German. She did not own a single book. What she did was she went to the local library. It was a good library with good people working in it, all women, of course. One of them had previously had a job in the local kiosk. She was a friend of my mother and a passionate reader. That library is closed now, I'm sorry to say. My mother showed me how the books were organized, the fiction, the poetry. She explained to me this wonderful invention called the Dewey classification system, that if you gave it half an hour of your attention, you could get the basics of it, and it could point you in any direction you felt like going if you wanted to educate yourself. This impressed me so much that after I quit school one year before my final exams, because they didn't give me time enough to read, I went to the main public library in Oslo to knock at the personnel manager's door and told him he had to give me a job. And he did. Those were the days. So I tra trained to be a librarian, but after three years of that, I got the job in a bookshop, a wonderful bookshop called Tromsmo in the center of Oslo. It was a little like the, you know, the City Lights bookstore in San Francisco, but it was better than American literature, in fact. It was my university. And it was there I started to read the Irish. Joyce and Beckett, of course, my all-time favorite storyteller, Frank O'Connor, and Sean O'Fillan. I read Liam O'Flaherty and Brendan Bean, Edna Bryan and Sean O'Casey, the autobiography. I read Little Yeats, too, and have seen his gravestone. I went there with the famous lines, cast a cold eye on life, on death, horseman pass by. Those words always made me want to go home and write. I don't know why. All this I say to flatter you, of course, but conveniently, it is also true. <laughs> and I say to avoid talking about my novel, Out Stealing Horses, which incidentally is why I am here. I avoid it because I guess you expect me to say something wise about it. But as everyone in this room already know, a work of fiction that is only moderately successful in its own field is always wiser than its author. And we should rejoice and be happy for that. For you, as well as I, have heard authors talk about their work and have been left none the wiser. I can say this, though, that when you start a novel with perhaps a very slim idea of what it is going to be about, and a little scared move into a territory that is unknown to you. I have found that something very wonderful happens, and that is that the world of your own reading opens up to you, and you realize that there have been someone there before you. And I have never found that in the least oppressive. Instead, it is a comfort. You are not alone. For example, you cannot be a Norwegian and write a novel like this and not be aware of a book called Pan, published in the 1890s by Knut Hansen. 
But more important, as this is payback time, those of you who have read Out Stealing Horses cannot have missed the open homage to Charles Dickens, or perhaps more the feel of Dickens and how he worked with fate or with whole lives and that struggle to change those lives, lives before it was too late. And there are more, of course, L.P. Hartley, William Maxwell, Richard Ford, books with a voice of urgency in them. And then when I was hesitating to start the final chapter, not wanting to get off, or go, not wanting to get off on the wrong foot, I woke up one night with some lines ringing in my head. And those lines were in English. I jumped out of bed, ran into the living room, and immediately found the book that I had not read for 10 years, opened it, and there they were, the opening lines of Voyage in the Dark by Jean Rhys. And they go like this. It was as if a curtain had fallen, hiding everything I had ever known. It was almost like being born again. The colors were different, the smells different, the feeling things gave you right down inside of yourself was different. Not just the difference between heat and cold, light and darkness, purple, gray, but the difference in the way I was frightened and the way I was happy. I translated those amazing lines and I used them and I knew I could not go all wrong. My point is, as you see, you are your own master but you are not alone. And when I say that a novel which is any good is always wiser than its author, it is of course the reader that makes it so, adding her intelligence, sensitivity and generosity. So you can all imagine my intense and upset pleasure when these readers, this jury, decided to honor outstealing horses. I mean, from that shortlist? Of course you do, and that is why you understand how happy I am, and also that it should come from Ireland, from Dublin. How fantastic. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to Anne Bourne for her great work for her generosity and for her patience with me, who is perhaps not the easiest person to work with. Thank you very much to Jeff Mulligan and the people at Harville Secker. And thank you very much to Christopher McElhaus, the one and only. To have been selected by him in the first place to be on his list has been a great honor. And finally, thank you to Norla, Norwegian Literature Abroad, for their constant support and for the fact that they have been banging for so long at the door of the English-speaking world and just might have gotten a foot in. It is not easy, I can tell you, but this brilliant invention, the International Impact Dublin Literary Award, may perhaps be used as a crowbar on that door. I think so. In any case, and again, thank you so very much. We are not alone. You are not alone. Thank you.